You can see here at the back of the head this dotted line. And this dotted line indicates where the calcarine sulcus is. And it's what we'll talk about uh, for the most part in this lecture. And you can see here lights going round and round different visual fields of this person. And you can see when the light is on, on this side, the, this being the right side of the head, so when it's on the left here of the subject, uh, the right side of the calcarine is activated. So the, the opposite visual field, or the visual field opposite <clears throat> to the, the, the part of the cortex that's being activated. Also, you'll notice that when it's like now above the eye or the head, then the, the lower part here gets activated. And when it's below, the upper part here above the calcarine gets activated. So things are, are flipped. Now we'll see how that happens. But the first thing is uh, let's see how it gets to um, the calcarine. Now you can see here um, that light striking each eye and the one that's green okay, is always crossing to the opposite side. So, so this side of the brain is seeing everything which is in this case the left is seeing everything to the right. So from both eyes. So one of the eyes, the signal has to cross over. And it crosses over here in the optic chasm. So it's the green that's always crossing. And it's the medial side of the, of the retina that is doing the crossing. And the medial side of the retina is everything from the fovea uh, to, to, to the left, okay, so that where you're looking defines where the fovea is, and uh, so where your eyes are pointing. Now you can see here um, two ganglion cells, and you can see that this, this uh, small one here, that's near the fovea, this indentation here, and it's going to a structure here called the LGN, and the LGN is the part of the thalamus that receives visual input. And you can see that this thalamus has six layers, and they're colored red and blue. And the red layers are the ones that are receiving here signal from this eye, and we'll see that there's, uh, and, and, and there's also the other eye, and these are six layers that are receiving signals from the left eye. Whoops, I forgot to mention this guy. This guy here is one of the ganglion cells in your periphery, and it's receiving signals from uh, these large rods and cones, mostly rods, and it can't see clearly because it has these large receptive fields. And so it's projecting both to your lateral geniculate nucleus, but in this case, layers over here on this side, different layers. It's also projecting into a structure called SC, or superior colliculus. That's located in the brainstem, so near the neck part of your, your head, just above the neck. And that, the spirit colliculus is involved in uh, what, what, what's called the visual grass prefix. So someone walks in the door and I notice it, and I turn my head and eye towards that person. When I turn my head and eye towards that person, then I see that person with my fovea. Okay? So this signal here is telling me 
where something interesting is. And the signal from the fovea helps me determine what that, that object is, who that person is. Okay. And we'll cover, we'll, we'll speak about that pathway, those two pathways. Um, we'll, con we'll continue in the next lecture and many of the le lectures that follow. So you can see here that there's a red eye and a blue eye, and there's red layers and blue layers. So the, the signal from both eyes hasn't come together yet. So uh, each eye projects to different layers, so different parts of each lateral rectus, each uh, lateral geniculate nucleus. Now, these ganglion cells, they, they, they grow um, during development to particular areas in the, the, the superior uh, in the lateral geniculate nucleus. And different parts of the, um, the retina grow to, to different parts of the lateral geniculate nucleus. And how do they do that? Well, first what happens is during development, um, this, the, 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 the socket of where your eye lies develops this chemical gradient. And uh, so you can imagine this gradient has, a, has, has a, this, this type of chemical over here and another type of chemical over here. And the retina, which lies on top, um, develops the same chemical gradient. So whatever is this chemical down here is kept here as well. So when then ganglion cells develop, they take on this same gradient. And it's position dependent. So here it's bluer and here it's greener, and that sort of indicates a difference between the two. And then these ganglion cells um, start searching for the same gradient that's developed in the lateral geniculate nucleus. And so you can see that this cell here crossed over and found this particular area of the lateral geniculate nucleus to make a synapse to. Okay. And later on, another, this ganglion cell, because it's coming from this part of the eye, searched and found this part of the lateral geniculate nucleus to connect to. So one learns to cross over to the other side, and the other learns to stay on the same side. And again, different parts of this map onto different parts of this layer. Now, there's lots of things that we don't understand yet about the LGN. And three of these are, why are there so many layers? We, we can sort of imagine that there has to be, for some reason, one for each eye, you know. And then there's ones for uh, near the fovea, and there's ones near the, the periphery, okay? So you can imagine them should be perhaps four layers. But why are there six? Nobody really knows. The other thing that's surprising is that, that most of the connections into the, the, the LGN is not from the eye, but from the visual cortex um, that it's, it's sending signals to, and from uh, 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 regions that surround the LGN. The third thing that's, that's, that's uh, puzzling is that with the receptive fields here are very similar to the receptive fields that we saw the, for LGN neurons. So they're the same circular surround, on center or off center. So nothing but just changed. So one, again, wonders why this connection forms. So there's still, if you guys go into research, there's still a lot to be found 
uh, about how the brain works. And this is important because uh, this LGN is part of the thalamus, and all your sensory information goes through the thalamus. So if we can figure out what, what, the, what the LGN is doing for vision, one could figure out what it's doing for the other senses as well. Now, where does the LGN go to? Well, it goes to here at the back of the brain. So this is the brain from the outside. And you can see a little bit here called the primary visual cortex. If you sort of separate the two halves of the brain, you can see the, the, the medial side or the inside of the brain. And you can see that, again, here's the calcarine. I've sort of drawn it as a straight line here. Um, and and your, your primary visual cortex is around this, this calcite. And it's given different names. It's called, we'll call it primarily this thing called V1. And, and subtextbook that's called Area 17. And it's also called, in anatomy books, the striate cortex. Now, you can see here another example of, of the of, of the uh, V1. And here you can see it becoming unfolded. So it's usually the, the, the V1 is sort of tucked in to the calcite. It's a fold in the brain. And you can see here uh, we've uh, unfolded it, sort of flattened out the brain a little bit. And you can see what's inside this fold. And I'll pass my mouse around these different regions, and you can see that here, when I'm lighting up something above the eye, something below the calcarine lights up. And this, this part here is at the front end of the calcarine, so the anterior end. And over here, when I light up this part, it's above the calcarine, but again, at the front end of it. If I go here, again, it's up, this part is above the eye, and so that lights up below the calcarine, and over here above the calcarine. And now that's the most posterior part of the eye. So the fovea, remember, is located at the very back of the calcarine. Now, if we look at it more closely, this is the fold, and this is the bottom of the calcarine. That's where we just unfolded in that previous diagram. And you can see that, that, that the, the brain is folded. Um, this is gray matter here, and this is white matter below, and this is the surface of your cortex. And the reason it's folded, you, you see many, many folds in it, is that it wants, you want to have lots of gray matter. And the reason you want lots of gray matter is this is where your neurons are. The white matter then contains all the wiring to the different parts of the brain. But your neurons are located here. Neurons are where your memories lie. Okay, that's where the, all the connections occur. And as the connections change, your memories change. Now you can see it, this, this is again this gray matter, and it has layers in it. Now what, all you have to remember is layer one is on top, layer six is at the bottom, and layer four C is in the middle here. And in this part of the brain, layer 4C is very thick. And that's why it's called the striate cortex, because it makes a big striation here. And the reason it's thick is because it's got this massive input from the eye through the LGN. And you can tell where this V1 area stops, because this thickness suddenly becomes thinner again. So the anatomist, anatomist knew for a long time where V1 
lay based on how thick this layer was. Now, you can see here a cell in layer 4C. And you can see that it looks much like your ganglion cell, which then looks much like your lateral geniculate cell. Now, if you look further uh, in, in other layers, you find this a thing like this, which looks, it's called a simple cell. And you can see this line rotating. And when the line becomes horizontal, this cell, cell starts firing. So this cell prefers a line that's horizontal. There are other cells that prefer a line that's vertical, and still other cells that prefer lines of every possible orientation. And also in layers above and below layer 4, one finds things called complex cells. So again, this complex cell prefers, this one in particular, prefers a horizontal line. Okay. And, but it per, likes, it doesn't matter for this cell where exactly this horizontal line lay. So it's got this big space in which this horizontal line can be. This one here, for a simple cell, has to be right here in the middle of the receptor field. So this complex cell is becoming more positionally invariant, so it doesn't care the position. And some of these complex cells like line, horizontal lines that are moving, or vertical lines that are moving, lines of a particular orientation. Now, how are these cells formed? Well, you can imagine that th this is your retina, and you have receptive fields of ganglion cells, these round things. Okay? And what you want to change them in is into this simple cell, the simple cell that has got this elongated receptive field. And the way you do it, that is combine cells from LGN that receive these receptors, this, this input, and send them to these layer 4 C cells, and then bring them together into a single simple cell. So you do it through convergence by connecting the, the right uh, ganglion cells to the right lateral geniculate cells to the right 4C cells, you get the simple cell that likes horizontal lines. Now, if you do the same, you connect several simple cells to a complex cell. Each of the simple cells like horizontal lines. You'll get this complex cell that likes horizontal lines over this larger receptive field. Now, to get a little more complicated, you have these end stop cells or hypercomplex cells. And you can see this one here, you can see its firing rate, and it's increasing now, and it seems to like a line of this particular orientation, uh, this particular length. So it prefers a line of a particular length, a line that is this long. Others are like this. They don't care so much about the length, but that a line ends here. Okay, so it cares where a line stops. This, we'll see why this might be important in a minute. Okay, why is this important clinically relevant? This is a, I used to teach the first, second year medical students uh, about these cells as well. About now, one or, one or two of them would raise their hand. Why am I studying this, you know? Why is this important? Well, it's important for two reasons. One is that uh, this was all found 
not so long ago, in the 1980s, uh, by a fellow called David Hubel. And David Hubel had a colleague called Thorson Weasel, and uh, they got together and they found these two cells, these types of cells. Now, these types of cells are important because they're sort of like the building blocks of how your brain works. So we saw that ganglion cells uh, became uh, simple <laughs> cells, became complex cells. They, the simple cells like very particular things, horizontal lines of a particular orientation in a particular place. Complex cells like things more general, like uh, lines, the same, that same line, but anywhere. And so what your brain is doing is making things more and more, ability of cells to recognize more and more complex things. And we'll see next week that there are cells in your brain that light up for a particular phase. Okay. So the, this, this process uh, gave us a hint of how the brain puts together um, uh, complex information. The other thing about uh, David Hubel was that he, he grew up in Windsor, Canada, and he went to McGill University, and then managed to get a Nobel Prize for this work. So um, um, he was made famous. Um, and this has clinical relevance because he, his, this work that he did also explained why you develop something called amblyopia. And we'll see in a moment uh, what, what it was that he found. So, now, one, I'm going to talk about these this patients that have these blind spots, um, it, not in, in their eye, but in their cortex. So similar to the ones we talked about in the eye, but now it's in the cortex. The odd thing about these patients is that if you, you place them in a room with like vertical lines behind them, and they look at a face with their blind spot, the blind spot disappears. The, 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 the person's face will disappear. Um, and the vertical lines will still be there. And if this blind spot is small, the patient is totally unaware of this blind spot. Now, you might find this puzzling, but all of you have blind spots in each of your eyes at this moment and are totally unaware of them. Now, why is this happening? Well, this is happening um, because cells here, um, the, 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 the the simple and the complex aren't firing because there's no input from the retina uh, in this part of the cortex. But cells here do fire because they get input from um, the peripheral part of your, your eye and your cortex. And they signal these end stop cells. And this end stop cell fires and tells you that a line stopped here. But it doesn't say, the brain assumes that line continues through your blind spot. Now, we'll show you in a moment that your eye is doing the same thing. Okay, where is this blind spot? Your blind spot. Well, here's your phobia, and here's where your optic nerve, or your, all your ganglion cells, exit the eye. And that, that, the middle of it, and all your blood vessels as well, and the middle of it, there are no receptors. So you're blind there. And this blind spot isn't small. It's about the size of the moon as it appears in the sky. That's a pretty substantial area to be non-functional and for you to be totally unaware of. So let's, let, if you 
want to, uh, to do this at home, you should do it. I would highly recommend you recommend that you do it. You can't do this with a screen up there because um, you can't unless you want to walk forward and backward in the room to get it the right size. But what you do, she should do, if you have a piece of paper or or your laptop, is to close one eye, look at the or close the left eye, look with your right eye at this X. Okay, and move your laptop in it. You move it closer. I'm right at the point where I can't see the red dot. So if, you, if you're similar to me, about this distance, the red dot should disappear. Okay. And so you, you've placed the red dot in your blind spot and your other eye can't see because it's closed. Okay. Now, if instead, oops, we look at this line here, okay, and you keep the same distance, the break in the line should disappear. It should appear like a continuous line. Your end stop cells are telling you that there's no line here because there's no end stop cells to tell you, in fact, that a line uh, did stop here because they're not coming from this part of the book. Then, whoop, he presses the wrong button. Boom. Here, just like the patient, you should not see the face, but be able to see the lines behind the face. And more surprisingly, here, the blue spot should disappear, and where the blue spot is, is filled with yellow. And most surprisingly, this funny pattern here should appear in your blind spot. Okay? So the moral story is your brain is filling things in the best it can. You can't see any blind spots. Well, for two reasons. First, both your eyes are open, and the blind spots are located in different places in your two eyes. They're sort of mere images of one another. But even with one eye closed, you're totally unaware of the blind spot in each eye. And there is this big thing about the size of the moon that's not receiving any input. And your brain is making up all that signal as your mind moves around. Okay, the visual cortex also improves on what you see. Okay. These um, um, simple cells, by combining information from lots of ganglion cells, uh, get to see lines of a particular orientation, but they can also see these lines more sharply. So if your ganglion cells basically are like these little, see these, can, are good at distinguishing one dot from two dots. So if you were to step back at the screen, at some point, these two dots should appear as one. Okay? But if you were to look down at these lines, you could, even though this is, seems like one, this clearly appears as two lines. So you can see these lines better than these dots. And you move over to here, and suddenly these dot lines appear as one line, too. You're standing back so far. But basically this difference is this is what your ganglion cells here, and this is what your cortex sees. Okay? This difference is how your cortex improves on your vi the vision that your eye provides. Again, this this repeating. This is what the difference is, what the cortex adds. Okay, so ganglia cells see dots, the simple cells see lines. Um, so, what, so it's improving. And what this is, it's called hyperacuity. That's what um, simple cells right, give you this uh, hyperacuity. 
your your the clinical chart that uh, optometrist uses to test your eyes. The, that clinical chart is made of letters, and those letters are composed of lines. And so your clinical chart is testing both the ability of your eye and your cortex. Now, when you look at your cortex, there are many more cells there than there are um, ganglion cells or lateral geniculate cells. And the reason for that is that each cell goes to many cells. So each LGN cell is sending their signal to many, many other cells. So let's take a look at a, a simple cell. So this one here in the middle is going to several uh, simple cells, each one turn, tuned to a particular line. So these three cells combine, these three cells combine, or these three cells combine. Each one determines a line of another orientation. So you have lines of simple cells here that are tuned to those orientations. And to each of them, this cell A provides an input. Now, they're not just four, th three orientations that, that you're sensitive to. Um, if, if, you, if, it, if you could tell what orientations are at five degree interval, you'd have 36 different orientations. But in fact, you're, you're sensitive to many, much, much more gradations of, of, of degrees. And so there are thousands of orientations that you're sensitive to. And so the, the, this cell provides signal to many thousands of simple cells. And that's why we have this expansion. Now, if you look at V1, blow it up, this is the calcarine running down the middle of it. Some parts here uh, are coming, getting their signal from the periphery, and some parts here are getting signal from the fovea. And you can't see these little squares but anatomically they exist, and each little square is sensitive to one particular part of your retina, and the adjacent square is sensitive to an adjacent part of your retina. So it's, it's making a map, and these little squares are called hypercubes. They're about uh, one by one millimeter wide. Now we see here that, that the, the retina, which is uh, the, uh, the, fo the fovea, which is just a small part of, of, the, of the eye, the retina, uh, is, is mapping a large part of your visual cortex because there's many, many ganglion cells from the fovea that send signals down the optic nerve to the cortex, and the same magnification occurs in the cortex. So the, the, you can see here, this is a picture of my brother-in-law reading a paper. Um, and you can see, this is what the eye would see. This is sort of a, a diagram of maybe what his visual cortex would see. You can see the nose, which is close to the fovea, if you're looking here, is magnified. There's many more cells represented. So it distorts what the eye is seeing. Now, if we look within these layers in the visual cortex, you can imagine this is the column, that's the surface, and these are the six different layers. This is 4C, that's this important layer in the middle. And you can see the right eye has an input and the left eye has an input. And in this layer 4C, we have this circular surround receptive field. Okay. They don't care about the orientation of lines yet. Um, and, and these are monocular, so they're getting signals from one eye or the other eye, but not both. If we go above or below layer 4C, we find these simple and then complex cells. And what's important about them is that they start getting signals from both eyes. So they are the first part of the brain which gets this combined signal. And that's important because it allows you to see depth. 
and depth is um, we'll see we'll see what what the phenomenon that is in a moment. So each hyper column extracts features, and one of the features is this depth, or what other another term for it is stereopsis. If you look down a binocular microscope, you see a cell in depth. It's very different from what you see with just one eye. On it. Now, these, so in layer 4C, you have these monocular cells. We indicate, so the ones coming from this eye are indicated in this diagram in green, and the other ones coming from this eye are indicated in yellow. And you can see in the layers above and below layer 4C, both are being combined. Okay. And those are but the binocular cells, both eyes. Now, down the middle of each of these columns, you have these things called blobs. A really fancy name that the anatom anatomists came up because that's what they saw when they looked. And that's where we find these double opponent cells that we studied last week. So these blobs contain cells with circular surround receptor fields that are sensitive to color. Okay. Now around them, in sort of these, these um, di uh, tri triangular shaped um, parts of the cortex, like spokes of a wheel, you have cells that are sensitive to particular lines and particular orientations. In a particular spoke um, or pinwheel, you see all the cells have the same orientation sensitivity. So um, within this one, let's say, all the, all the cells would have a horizontal sensitivity. Once the next slab will be a slightly off horizontal, the next slab slightly off horizontal for that. And so cells, hmm, animation, I have to fi fix that one. The line isn't tur turning around smoothly. Um, anyways, uh, so the reason these all these cells congregate together is because they like to be near their own kind and they like to be near their own kind because it makes the connection simpler the axons don't have to transmit as far now if we'll talk about visual de deprivation and we'll find out that that has a very profound effect on the the structure of the visual cortex early in birth. Now, at birth, normally, you have simple cells. Uh, this, is, this is a layer of, above layer 4C. So these simple cells are receiving information from both eyes. I indicate that by a red synapse or a green synapse. So you see that see they're that receiving a mixture. And it's, it's about equal. As the person develops into an adult, uh, you see that, that ones over here start preferring the right eye, and ones over here start preferring the left eye. They still, many of them, especially at the edges here, uh, get both eyes, as we saw in the diagram, the, 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 the single spreads to one side or the other side. So many of them are many of them are binocular here, a few aren't. But uh, so this is this is structure. This is as big as that. Now if in this case the right eye were deprived, something is wrong with the right eye, it isn't seeing this clearly in this very early um, infant. What happens is 
that the input from the LGN is competing for space. Okay? It's trying to find connections. And it's, it's like a war going on. Um, and the left eye has a better ability to make connections because the input from that is stronger. It takes over the cortex. And it takes over the cortex as long as this eye is deprived. So it's important early in life, if you have a problem with one eye, to fix that eye. Okay. Because what happens is that there's, there's a critical period. And if, for example, I had developed a cataract as, a, as an adult and persisted for years and years and years, and finally I had the cataract removed, my vision from the, the eye that had the cataract would be restored instantly. But in this case, if this, if this baby has a, a, a defect and you wait till the critical period is passed, that, this cort that eye maintains this connection to that part of the cortex and this eye can't regain it. Okay. So the, the, the defect persists for, for life and this is what's called um, uh, amblyopia. So how do these, con what, what happens? How do the connections, how is one eye take over from the other eye? Well, these are synapses from your two eyes, one eye, the other eye. And there's two types of receptors. One of them, the one colored in blue, it's called an M MNDA receptor. And don't ask me what that stands for. That's, that's not my specialty. Um, I'm very bad at names. Anyways, what, what, what happens is this, this is normally blocked with a, 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 a magnesium uh, I think, uh, molecule. And when this cell depolarizes, that, that uh, blockage disappears. And it allows the cell to change its connections. We'll see that in a moment. But basically, uh, a lot of the, 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 the connections develop because of synchrony. So this cell, this input comes at the same time as this input or this input comes at the same time as this one, or all four inputs come at the same time. Whatever is maintaining synchrony at the same time um, is critical. So the, the saying is, cells that fire together wire together. This is the simple pro, um, process that defines all your memory, believe it or not. The simple little process. So the steps in this are the following. So first you have this large depolarization because these guys fired at the same time. If only one of them fired, it wouldn't be large enough to open up the channel and this calcium would not flow in. So the calcium flows in through, through this, this MD, MND8 receptor and that, that triggers the release of this um, neural growth factor. The neural growth factor hits the synapse that was just activated okay, and causes it to expand. Okay? It becomes bigger. The one that didn't fire becomes smaller. Okay, and so, on. so that all this process is going on continuously in your cortex, and it is what determines whether or not you can remember this lecture at the end of the day. Okay, so you can just, just illustrate. This is synchronous, this is, fires at different times. So this one fires and then this one fires. And in contrast, this guy will repeat that. That are, these guys fire at the same time 
these guys fire at different times. And so a result of that, these two cells expand, and these two cells contract. And that's what happens, happens in amblyopia. These connections retreat from the cortex. And this, this eye takes over that part of the cortex. Now, when both of them fire at the same time, uh, both connections are maintained, and you can see in stereo. Okay. Now, this is kind of remarkable, because you can imagine this line here is a line that appears over there in your visual field, and it fires, okay? And it fires these ganglion cells and fires a line of ganglion cells in this eye and a line of ganglion cells in that eye. And somehow, through this repeated slump, activation, the same cell, the same simple cell in your cortex gets tuned to both eyes, okay? You see this line with both eyes. Okay? It gets connected to the same little cell. And that is what lets you see in stereo. And if you don't have that, that synchronous activity, you, you develop amblyopia. Now, another form of, uh, of change in the visual cortex that happens is with a child that has strabismus. Now, in a child with strabismus is a child in which each eye isn't pointing in the same direction. So one eye is pointing one way, the other eye is pointing in a different direction. So the two eyes don't see the same image in the same place on the retina. You see a double vision. If you cross your eyes, you can, you can see that now. You can see two, two heads, and we'll ask you to do that in a moment. Now, what happens if, 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 if both eyes don't see the same part of the visual field is that normally you have these binocular cells here and here. You have monocular cells. You don't, you, each eye is equally represented. So this eye is just as wide as this eye. It's, it's representation of the cortex. But all the cells above and below don't have a binocular input because it never received the same input at the same time. And as a consequence, this child uh, won't see in depth. Okay? Now, to get a, a, an, an idea of what depth means, okay, I want you to try the following. Uh, cross, look at that, those flowers, but cross your eyes. And cross your eyes until you see three boxes of flowers, okay? And stare at the middle one. So concentrate on the middle one. And the middle one should pop out of the screen. You should see it in 3D. And you should be able to move your eyes, your head back and forth, and it, the vision of this flower should change as you move your head back and forth. And the way I, I took this picture of flowers that are in our garden, I took one picture and I moved my camera and took the, another picture of the same flowers. Okay. And so each of these pictures are the same flowers, but they're slightly from a different position. And that's what your eyes see, a slightly different position. The two eyes don't see the same thing. And the... That's what you should see through a microscope when you look at a cell uh, with two binocular ones. Now, if you look at this using the same trick, you should see this bar, a single bar in the middle of the three squares that you're seeing, and it should be coming in and out of the screen. So first the, the blue a uh, bar appears out of the screen and then goes into the screen and then out of the screen, into the screen, and out of the screen. Okay. 
you might have to practice this at home, uh, but it's worthwhile. Now, what's happening is, so if you had, let's say, a filter over each eye, and one eye would, could, would see this, this blue line, and the other eye would see this red line, and you'd have a cell in your cortex that would see both of them, but they w would be on the eye, there's the disparity, there's a difference. But there's a cell in your brain that likes this particular disparity, this difference. And when it fires, it tells you whether this, this part of the line is sticking out of the screen or into the screen. And there's another cell that prefers another disparity, a different disparity. And as a consequence, you see the line tilting in and out. Let's look at this in more detail. So again, this is, you're looking here, and this little ball appears in front or behind the eye. And when it, and if you look at, keep fixating that same point, you should see this ball appearing to the medial side or the lateral side of each eye. And the two eyes should see the, the cortex should see this particular view, okay? And it has, sometimes the disparity will be nothing, sometimes the disparity will be one way, and sometimes the disparity will be the opposite way. And that will be what induces death. So let's look at a partic one particular cell in your uh, above and below layer 4C. So this is its firing rate, okay? You're looking here, and as I bring this dot closer and closer, you can see that here its firing rate increased, and then it increases even further, and then decreases again. So this cell likes this particular disparity, a little over to one side on, on, on the left eye, and a little over the same distance on the right eye. Okay. And that tells it that this dot is nearer to it than when I, where I'm fixing. So in summary then, the eye flips the image, okay? It, uh, it also, the retina then magnifies it so that the fovea has a much bigger representation than the periphery. You still have one eye and the other eye, and it sends it to V1, where it's combined, and you see the image, a single cell sees the image from both eyes. And that's where depth is computed. Also in the primary visual cortex, you get things separated into channels, and some channels extract color in the blobs, some of the binocular cells get depth and disparity. And then we have simple and complex cells, which tells you, gives you edges of articular orientation, and often their motion. Okay, I think that's it for today.